Whether you're an avid property investor or about to buy your first property, why do it alone when you could partner with Australia's best buyer's agent? Director of Pure Property Investment, Property Investment Professionals of Australia board member and REB Buyer's Agent of the Year, Paul Glossop, can take your portfolio to the next level. Get in touch today to discuss your investment goals. Get one-on-one insight from Paul Glossop. And for the first 100 people, this service is completely free. Head to purepropertyinvestment.com today to schedule your consult with Paul Glossop directly. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Hello everyone, how are you going? Welcome to the podcast today as we uh, strap in for another episode that's going to be dominated by COVID because COVID has changed the way in which a lot of people invest. I've been getting some really good feedback via the podcast channels where we host the podcast, iTunes for example, or on Android some good feedback coming in and a lot of people are really enjoying the investor stories at the moment. So it's a big focus for us moving forward to keep telling the stories of property investors, irrespective of the size of their portfolio, how long they've been investing. But we obviously dovetail this in with conversations that we have with people that work within property in Australia who can help give us greater insights into market dynamics and some of the parameters that the best investors are focusing right now to make sure they are as informed as possible investing in the right way. And there's a lot of unknowns in the property market at the moment. Everyone's referring to what has been called up until this point, the September cliff. I want to have a chat about that today because whether or not you subscribe to this whole idea of September cliff, it might have been pushed forward a little bit uh, into March 2020 as a result of extension of government stimulus packages. Also, I want to have a conversation around how government stimulus packages are affecting property markets now into 2021 and into the future as well. There's a whole bunch of different commentators out there with different opinions on this, so I want to get to the bottom of it. To help me have that conversation, David Hancock, Director at Bonari, which is a property investment financial planning business. David, how are you going? You well? Yeah, great. Thanks, Phil. Great to be here. Where are you based, David? Where's HQ for you guys? Uh, HQ is Sydney, although okay. pre-COVID, we traditionally done a lot of travel up and down the East Coast. Okay, which you're locked down now doing. Um, did I just hear that the borders with Queensland have just been shut? Is that Did I get that right? You yeah, said- I believe so. I think there's a lot of people who had holidays booked, so that'll be interesting. But yeah, I think so for Greater Sydney, I think that Queensland shut the gate for now anyway. Mm, and obviously, um, we're locked out of Melbourne at the moment, or that border shut. We seem to be doing pretty well as a state. Uh, Queensland last night or yesterday didn't record any new positive cases in COVID-19, so they're performing pretty well. Uh, New South Wales doing okay. So it's very different, the game of property at the moment. It's, uh, you can't jump on a plane anymore and go and check out a potential investment property. So most people are using the marvels that is the internet now to make sure that they are investing in property the right way. Now, David, a couple of things I want to chat about, which I referenced in my introduction there, government stimulus packages. So what we know is that the government came out recently saying uh, job keeper will be extended in a different form after September of 2020. So at the moment, uh, it's about 1500 bucks per fortnight or three grand a month, however we're going to look at it for job keeper and job seeker was a doubling of the current unemployment benefits. So a lot of people there are being supported by these mechanisms or metrics, which is giving some sort of sense to underpinning the ongoing health of the property market, whether it's healthy or not, we'll have that conversation around that. Now, the government's come out, uh, David, and said that it will extend it into March next year. It's got to look a bit different. Mm-hmm. I think it's 1200 bucks for JobKeeper. It'll go backwards from there and job seeker is going to be smaller. Now, someone made a really good point to me and it was around, there's two dynamics here when it comes to property. There is the business of real estate and that's the buying and selling of real estate. Yeah. And then there's the business of property investment. So, asset management, as in having people in investment properties paying your mortgage. Now, one of the biggest takeaways, I believe, in terms of government stimulus package when it comes to extending it out from September is the fact that there is a little bit more stability for those on JobKeeper or JobSeeker, that they're still going to be able to pay their rent, which is good news for property investors. Now, this is a big point, and often it doesn't really get focused on because everyone's talking about buying or selling real estate. What's your view of this, mate? Yeah, look, it's an interesting one. And feel like one of the things that we're really constantly talking about is there's no one property market throughout Australia. There's many, many micro markets. So look, I'll give you an example. Take, for instance, Sydney's eastern suburbs, an area like Bondi Beach, which is obviously known by all Australians. This is an area that's traditionally quite a tightly held rental market. But you've actually, for the first time in 15 years, you've seen 
the rental prices start to fall because a lot of that market or part of that market is supplemented by overseas tourists, you know, students, people that live here but may come from foreign countries that may have returned. And you've also had, a, if you like, a conversion of short-term stays because the tourist market's kind of really fallen away into uh, more traditional long-term rentals. So, you know, that's a market, for example, where, yeah, it's definitely having an impact and it's driving down prices. But then there are plenty of other markets around the country where we're actually seeing the reverse, where there's limited supply, people aren't traveling as much, expats are returning. So it's a really interesting one and it's very much specific from market to market. But look, I think, you know, job keeper and certainly job seeker is certainly propping up certain industries more than others. And those industries, for instance, maybe take hospitality, where you might see a lot of people that work in hospitality sort of rent and live in certain areas. Well, those markets have been impacted probably more than others. Yeah. And it's a good point. And a lot of people get caught up in this huge impact of COVID-19 and the spike in unemployment, which is going north. And whether or not that's a true reflection, the number that's out right now to what it actually is. Some industries have been impacted a lot more than others. And to reference one of them, you said they're hospitality, so bars, clubs, discotheques, you know, cafes in some way, restaurants, they've been hit pretty hard. The aviation sector was the first to feel it and they've felt it the hardest, obviously Virgin into uh, administration, you know, thousands of people let go at Qantas and Virgin. So these people have been impacted. But there's other parts of the economy which by and large has been relatively unscathed. You know, people working within public service, for example, they're pretty strong and stable jobs. Healthcare is not a bad business to be in right now. So there are pockets of the economy which are performing differently. Now, a lot of people thought, David, that you see big hit at the top end of town as a result of this, but these aren't necessarily the people in jobs that have been impacted the most. They're in that sort of hospitality area or what I bet you in aviation. So often big renters, big drives the economy, and you look at the education sector, which you touched on, which international students used to fill up most of the inner city stuff, you know, Surrey Hills or whatever here in Sydney. That's been hugely impacted. So these are the driving forces which are changing and shaping property now. I've got a lot of properties out in the western suburbs of Sydney. They're all tenanted at the moment, you know, but I know a lot of landlords who are really struggling and finding people in the inner city of Sydney yeah. right now. They've got to throw in like Netflix and Foxtel and stuff to even <laughs> yeah. get them in there, right? Are you seeing this? Yeah. Look, as I said, with the example of Bondi, I think that's a perfect example where you normally find that to be a really tight market and very difficult to, not difficult, but not the type of market that would fall from a rental perspective. So because you don't have the you know, the students and the overseas visitors propping that market up. Yeah, it is more difficult. People are doing things that they traditionally wouldn't do. They're offering discounted rents or they're offering more favorable terms or whatever really they need to do to get people in. Conversely, though, and you mentioned like one of our latest projects that just settled, you know, where it was four townhouses in a suburb called Green Slopes in Brisbane. This is a suburb that's approximately five, six kilometers from the center of the CBD, but it's a fairly established suburb with, you know, house prices starting from 900 a million upwards, you know, and some of those going well into the sort of two, three, four million dollars. So this is a, you know, kind of a product. So these were four bedroom townhouses. And for every single one that became available, we had an oversupply of three and four really strong rental applications. So it's just an example. And that's supported by the fact that there is very little limited supply of that type of product on the market. But also there's a number of hospitals in that area. You know, it's obviously a very sustainable space, the healthcare sector at this stage. So yeah, it really kind of depends what areas you're talking about and then what sort of traditional supply they have and, you know, areas that are fundamentally supported by local owner occupiers with a high proportion of people who live in their homes probably aren't experiencing the same sorts of challenges as areas like Bondi or you know, you talked about some of the other inner city areas. So it just really depends on the market you're talking about. I think the challenge most property investors are facing right now is an oversupply of information, oversupply of narrative, an oversupply of commentary, which can really be an inhibitor to decision making. My philosophy towards property investment is that if you can afford to invest in property, any time's a good time to invest in property if you can manage it from a cash flow point of view and you've got a good strategy in place. So how or what are your tips for making sure you don't get overwhelmed with market sentiment that might stop or shape the way in which you're investing? Because there are some good places to invest in right now in Australia. There are some good places to invest in in any capital city or any regional location. You just got to unearth what they are. Yeah, Phil, I think, look, Fundamentally, my view is property is a long-term investment. So I think if you're kind of realistic about your outcomes, I think now is a really good time 
particularly as you, you know, I think when we get out the other side of COVID, whenever that happens to be, we're going to be in a really unique environment, which is record low interest rates. People are also in an environment where they, who've got money, need to put it somewhere. So they may have a lot of share exposure already or a bit concerned about the volatility of the share market. So you're then kind of forced between property and shares because there's no return on cash and really in the bond market. So with record low interest rates, what we're finding with a lot of our purchases, unlike maybe other times in the last 10 years, the income alone on a lot of the properties is almost covering the interest cost and the running cost. So it's a really unique time. It's representing probably a pretty good opportunity to get into the property market. But I think one of the fundamental things is where we know property always does best is when there's limited supply and high demand, you know, and it's finding those areas around the country where fundamentally the local employer base is in jobs, the supply is fairly limited and the demand is still there, you know, and I think if you're able to find those pockets, you'll still do well, you'll still rent it well, you know, the returns will be there, but more importantly, you'll probably be setting yourself up for some really strong property growth over the coming sort of 10 years as and when everyone feels confident that things are returning to normal because the choices at the moment for investors, especially those investors sat on the sidelines, is fairly limited beyond shares to get a genuine return. So yeah, I think you know there's a lot of nervousness around, but I think at the end of the, the one thing that underpins residential property is that fundamentally we have to live somewhere. David, we're going to go a quick break. When we come back, I just want to get a bit of inside view on what the best investors are doing in this market back in a moment. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Pro- Property Investment Show with David Hancock, chatting all things investing in COVID-19 environment. Now, David, how concerned are you? Of, you know, If you look back to when COVID first hit, so I'm talking about March and then moving into April, a lot of the major lenders come out and some other sort of think tanks with dire predictions about price declines in, in property and some of the major banks, for example, the worst yeah. case scenarios they were painting were absolutely horrific and obviously caused a lot of media attention. Now, they've all come back and they've shaped a lot of their dialogue around this and there is going to be some declines in the market, but nothing akin to what was originally thought. How do you feel about it all? What are you seeing right now? How concerned are you about investing in property in a downwards market? Yeah, uh, look, you'd be lying if you said back in March when COVID originally hit that there wasn't concern across the board. I think just socially, economically, you know, health-wise, I think everyone felt some form of concern. Phil, I think what we've seen is, apart from one or two sensationalist views, most people were kind of predicting somewhere between 5 and 15%, and quite a lot of, in most areas, that hasn't materialised. So one of the reasons that I think it hasn't materialised is because there's very little supply in the market. So we've had very limited supply, people are staying in their homes. So I think from that perspective, and one of the, and one of the reasons we've had limited supply, it may just be through chance, is that back in sort of circa 2018, there was talk of property markets being overheated, particularly Sydney and Melbourne, and there was restrictions placed on investor lending through APRA. Plus, we had a, an election that many thought Labor might win, and that may impact some rule changes around property ownership from an investment perspective. So we really saw a tightening or, a, if you like, a fall off of new supply into a lot of the markets around the country. So just by chance, maybe we're at a point where there is a pretty limited supply environment and um, I think for a lot of the markets around the country, that because there's so much limited supply, we're not seeing the price falls because whatever demand is there is more than enough for the supply that's available. So, yeah, I think unemployment is the key. But from what we can tell, a lot of people's jobs are continuing as normal. They may be impacted to some degree with a reduction of their income, but many Australians around the country are still working and still earning a good income, apart from one or two industries like we talked about, hospitality, aviation, et cetera, who've been significantly impacted. So yeah, I think the long-term prognosis is really strong, but understanding that there is naturally a bit of fear around there for potential investors. So what you're talking to there, David, is liquidity. So if you put it into the same paradigm of the share market, you look at some stocks sometimes and they just don't trade and therefore their value doesn't go up or down because there's just no activity in it. So the less liquidity in the market, property markets, means there's less transactions, which means there's less volatility to the market and therefore sentiment-driven investing or buying or selling is limited. You're absolutely right there on the APRA during 2018 to limit investment lending, believing that there was a bit of heat in the market and they did a pretty good job in curbing some of the price growth. Some would say a little bit too 
effective or yeah. maybe not effective enough because it was a blanket approach rather than a specific state-based approach. I think most people get confused thinking that the Australian property market is Sydney and or Melbourne, but there's a whole other other markets in there Correct. which really yeah. were impacted. WA, for example, as a result of those restrictions. But what it meant was that a lot of people weren't thinking or they're buying their time for buying or selling a property. Now, once the federal election, you're absolutely right, came um, the coalition government was announced that it was staying in power. You saw a huge run on property then. There was a lot of buying, a lot of selling activities, but all the breaks now come on during COVID-19. So what it's doing is in many ways protecting the value of properties on the market because you haven't got a wholesale shift in people, either a whole bunch of people wanting to buy or a whole bunch of people wanting to sell, or there's more people wanting to buy than wanting to sell. So that's holding the values okay. What would need to happen, do you think, David, for that to change, for people to just go, Sell, 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 sell. It's got to come down to cash flow, right? Oh, I think it fundamentally comes down to unemployment. You know, it's not just like we, we talked about some of the sectors that have been impacted significantly. So, you know, if we're talking about some of the people that might work in cafes and restaurants who, you know, maybe they're foreign workers who are here on a visa, you know, without being, you know, elitist, these aren't people that traditionally maybe have purchased property, but they certainly prop up certain rental markets that we've talked about. Mm. Look, I think one of the interesting things, and I talk to a lot of agents up and down the East Coast, and they're telling us that there's a fairly large degree of activity from first home buyers who are feeling now is an opportunity to get into the market with record low interest rates, et cetera. So look, I, I think the way the property market really starts to fall is if we have an oversupply of properties, you know, and that sort of probably only going to happen if we have significant unemployment across industries that aren't currently being impacted, that then starts to sort of drive down prices. But at this stage, it doesn't look... I mean, to give you an example, Phil, when we first, kind of when March was came around and we started to survey a lot of the property managers, you know, pretty much from Geelong up to the Sunshine Coast that we talked to, they originally indicated that they had anywhere from 20 to 30% of applications for rental waivers or rental assistance uh, during COVID. But when they were went back to their, you know, tenants and asked for some proof, they said that really whittled down to about 1% to 5%, depending on, you know, where they were based and so forth. So the reality of it is that, you know, currently we've probably only got a small fraction of the population that have been significantly impacted. So I think until we see a large section of the population impacted and we start to see supply really increase, the property market will still hold up pretty well. The one caveat I'd say to that is in all down markets, Wherever here you have an oversupply, so there might be sort of apartment markets throughout sort of some of the more densely populated areas around the cities of some of our major cities, so whether it be Melbourne or Sydney or Brisbane or wherever, where you've got a lot of apartments, for instance, or a lot of houses being built that are predominantly being pitched to investors, that's potentially where we could see a bit of price fall. Because if the investment market sort of slows up, then they're not that excess supply is not being soaked up by the, the natural owner occupiers that would buy those properties. That's a really good point. And you're seeing that now in some of the inner city markets, which are traditionally the bastion of student markets where they, even I think of Alexandria, for example, out towards the airport here in Sydney, vacancy rates in those dwellings have really spiked as a result of this. But you make a really good point in regards to the other part of this equation. And we're sort of moving to the realm of being economists. And I'm not an economist, I'm just a commentator of this supply side of the equation in that Agents at the moment are struggling to win listings because people are sitting on their properties. They're thinking they don't want to sell at this point in time because they're going to be selling at a detrimental market price. On the other side of this is that the construction of new dwellings is slower than what was previously indicated or forecast to be at this point in time to satisfy the needs of a growing population. So what happens in the construction industry will determine and dictate the whole supply demand cycle for property investors or creating value in property. But that is only some markets where that is of relevance because you're getting some infill in some of these suburbs across the capital cities, but it's not wholesale infill right now. You've still got some major pockets of huge infrastructure development where they're building you know, apartments galore. And I think, for example, the new train line that heads out, the Norwest Rail, where they're building out whole new town centres, which have got plenty of apartments and also a lot of owner-occupier stuff. So as a property investor, it's about understanding these markets, David, and making sure that the properties that you're buying are directly connected with the strategic objective of where that property fits in your portfolio. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's, you know, I think you might have mentioned it right at the start of the conversation is about what can people do. One of the things people can do before you know, considering to purchase a property, if they're not engaging experts, is to just 
really get a feel for the local market. Talk to local real estate agents from a sales perspective, but also talk to local property managers because they generally give you a good handle. You know, if they're telling you that if you're going to buy one of these apartments and that there's like four or 500 on, they're about to be launched and mainly they were purchased by investors and it's going to really drive down the rents. Well, potentially, you, unless you're getting a really, really good deal, you'd be a little bit conservative about that type of purchase. But then there's other markets, as I've said, that are the opposite, that just have very limited supply and they've got really strong demand, who, if anything, rents are going the other way. So, yeah, it's one of those interesting things. One of the concerns for those markets traditionally catered towards maybe the interstate or overseas investor is the lack of immigration that can potentially take place. What I will say to that, though, is I, and I read an article the other day, it says we've had something like 300 plus thousand expats return since March. I mean, Australia has dealt with COVID really, really well, I think, as a country. And, you know, we are a very attractive place to live. So certainly when we come out of this period and the borders open again, I think that makes us more and more attractive to potential expats and investors. But I think that the concern about the lack of immigration in the short term is partly being countered by a number of expats returning, which I think is really interesting. Mm. David, we'll just get another quick break back in a moment. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show with David Hancock. Now, David, you mentioned a very important part of the property ecosystem, uh, sales agents and also property managers. What are you finding at the moment? Is your phone running hot at the moment with real estate agents? And this is always a testament to or an insight into how any market is operating, whether or not guys like you are getting more phone calls than you having to make. Are people trying to shift property cheaply at the moment or they're hard to find? It's hard to find good stock. Yeah, Phil, look, our business is based around finding what we would call an owner-occupier type property. So areas where there is proportionately a higher percentage of owner-occupiers and we are relocating stock, but it's certainly not easy. Mm -hmm. And we're certainly not finding that the vendors or sellers are discounting at all. And I think this kind of goes back a little bit to the lack of supply. So the markets that we're in and that we focus on by no means are people discounting on on the quality product. Now, any properties, whether it be a house or townhouse or apartment built in areas that have got a lot of supply and and probably a low proportion of owner-occupiers, you know, I've heard whispers of people maybe offering fairly big incentives, maybe on some of the larger apartment developments. But fundamentally, no, we we haven't seen that shift in prices. And in fact, you know, I know a lot of people we have contacted quite frequently, people that are trying to access the market, particularly in Sydney, in some of the blue ribbon suburbs, that just can't find any supply, mm. um, that are just sort of sat on the sidelines. There's, there's no real supply. And, and if you look at the days on market for a lot of these properties, a lot of them are going off market and they're going very quickly. So, yeah, that kind of gives you an indication of where the market's at. One of the reasons we haven't seen the price falls is because there is exit surplus demand to supply. And that's kind of where it sits at the moment. Yeah, it's a real basic lesson in property economics. There's a metric that a lot of the research houses will use, and that is around discounting rates. So how much discounting is happening at any given suburb in order for transacting property? So the bigger the discount, the more you could assume the stress the particular market is. Now, it's really easy. If there's lots of stock on the market and there's no one wants to buy, typically discounting is at its height. If there's no stock on the market and there's a lot of people that want to buy, there's very, very little discounting or it never even lands yet. Most transactions are off market. So these are the basic fundamentals that you need to understand as a property investor when you're considering a market, but it's just not the only things you need to be considering. Now, David, you know, when you look at a potential asset to acquire and, and, you know, whether or not this is for people who want to go doing this stuff themselves. In this current market, COVID-19 and planning out the 2021, what are the key things that you want to see in a location, in a street, in a physical asset? You talk about owner-occupier properties being part of the philosophy that you invest in. What do you really want to see and in what sort of hierarchy would you be looking for those? Yeah, look, we've got, we break our kind of research process down into eight key criteria, Phil, and one of those is things like market cycles. So, you know, if you look at a cycle of, say, Southeast Queensland, it's been fairly stagnant in the last 10 years. And one of the reasons that if you look previous 10 years, you know, it outperformed Melbourne and Sydney. So these things go in cycles. So that's one of the things we're looking at. And one of the key drivers for, say, Southeast Queensland market is, is interstate migration, which has really been on the rise as the unaffordability of sort of certain areas of Sydney. But first and foremost, if we're just looking at property as a whole, I mean, really understanding the diversity amongst the employment 
you know, are you in an area which has a wide range of employment or are you in an area that relies on one or two industries, maybe like tourism or mining or anything like this, which can be cyclical? And then just really understanding that the demographic profile, the type of person that is going to want to buy or rent this property. If you're in an area that's predominantly driven by families because they want to be near a local school catchment, then you probably want to be looking at a house or a townhouse. It's probably not an apartment market. Or conversely, if you're in an inner city area where people are quite happy to, to live in an apartment just because of affordability, because you're near uh, restaurants and transport and jobs. So just really getting a feel for that. And then sort of most importantly as well is Actually, when you locate the right area, is buying the right property. I mean, we see this a lot. We see people buy in the right area, but then they buy a property and it may be an apartment, but it might be that it's 40 square meters and it's too small for most people's liking, or it might not have enough natural light. You know, once you buy particularly an apartment and townhouse that's too small, there's not a lot you can do with it. So just make sure you understand what are the key criteria the local buyers are looking for when they are buying a particular property type. Yeah, it's really good. And I'll close with this question, David. What are you seeing the best property managers doing to support their investors in this current market with COVID-19? And one of them was stress testing whether or not someone's you know application for financial distress is a genuine application during COVID-19. So that's what I've seen. What else are they doing well? Yeah, I think they're just having consistent open dialogue with their tenants and their landlords. You know, I think the best property managers obviously would have fielded a lot of inquiries initially because let's face it, people are opportunistic. You know, if people think they can get 30% off their rent, even if they're unimpacted at that point, they'll do it because it creates more of a buffer at their end. But the reality of it is the best property managers are seeing through that. They're managing the situation. They're calling the bluff or they're, you know, as well on the other end, they're also relaying a, a realistic situation to their landlords. If they're in an area like Bondi that is impacted, they're going back with kind of evidence and proof of like, look, it has been impacted. You know, I know it hasn't gone down in the previous years, but this is where we sit right now. If we want to rent this property and we don't want to have periods of void where we don't have a tenant, then we need to meet the market, you know. So it's, they're being proactive. I mean, property managers that are proactive are worth their weight in gold. And, you know, one of the big parts of our business is seeking out those property managers and, and aligning them with our purchases because they make the whole process so much easier. So I think as long as you've got a proactive property manager that has an open dialogue between tenants and landlords, then generally you should be able to manage the situation fairly effectively. That's a good counsel. Uh, David Hancock, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. No, thank you. Thanks, Phil. Nice. Right, so remember to check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Uh, if you're not yet subscribing to our uh, daily uh, morning newsletter, so the first to know what's happening in property right across the nation, smartpropertyinvestment.com.au for slash subscribe. Social media is Smart Property HQ for headquarters across all the social channels. Go and check us out. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. Propertyology regards right now as a very exciting time for investing in Australian real estate. There are some fantastic opportunities that Propertyology can help you take advantage of before buyers re-emerge from their coronavirus cocoons. Propertyology has a national focus. Now more than ever, experience and knowledge are the most valuable currency. Propertyology has that in spades. To find out how Propertyology's multi-award winning buyers agents can help you prosper, contact them now at propertyology.com.au.